So we'll be starting in a few minutes. I want to play a song at the author's request, and then we'll get into it. So stick around. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., AKA Dr. G. I'm the captain of my ship and the master of my destiny. I am also the author of my script, the father of my family, PhD in history, Georgetown University. Now, what I would like for us to do is take a real solid listen to the song you're about to hear. We're only going to listen to about the first 90 seconds. I'll, I'll make a signal for it to stop. It's by a young lady called Jill Scott from Philadelphia, and it's called My Petition. She's talking about a relationship, and I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are about what she's saying about this relationship, because I think it will help set the foundation for our discussion here this evening. By the way, I'm really honored that you all came out and braved the elements and came out here tonight to be with me on Friday night. There's a lot of things you can be doing, including Netflix, but you're here with me and I'm very, very appreciative and we're going to have ourselves a good time. So without any further ado, why don't we listen to the first 90 seconds or so of my petition by Jill Scott. Okay, um, what did you hear her say about this relationship? What was she expressing? Was it a good relationship? I mean, did she believe in the relationship? The fact of the matter is, is that she actually wasn't talking about a relationship with another individual. Um, she was talking about a relationship with maybe something else, something larger. Does anyone have any idea what that might be? What this relationship was? Right, right. And then did anyone catch that part at the end about, oh, say, can you see? Has anyone heard those words before? Does that sound familiar? Right, it's from the very famous song that we you know, hear virtually every day, right? Uh, that's proclaiming you know, our um, allegiance to our country. And so I think this song really sets the table for our conversation tonight because Jill Scott is conflicted she wants to believe what this individual is telling her, but at the same time, this individual does not appear to be following through on their promises, but it's not an actual individual person. This is her petition to her country, right? And so there's this idea that when it comes to people of color, African-Americans in particular, have African-Americans had the full opportunity to cash in on this thing called the American dream as promised for virtually any person who comes into this country. So why don't we take a step back and talk about the actual title of the book? We can break that down and then talk a little bit about what the book means for many of us here today. The short title is American Dream Deferred, right? Um, Black federal workers in 1941 to 1981. The first two parts of the title, American Dream, refer to the Horatio Alger myth. Has anyone heard of Horatio Alger before? Okay. And so who, who is he? Do, do you? Absolutely. Excellent. 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 And so he wrote many books, as the young lady said, such as, you know, Strive to Success, Bound to Rise. And around the turn of the century, it really captured the imagination of many Americans who migrated over, well, 
at first they weren't Americans, but they came over to America looking for a new way, looking for a better life, right? And what I suggest is just as they saw the Statue of Liberty as welcoming them, the Statue of Liberty took on this iconic symbol of American being open. Bring me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, right? And so anyone could come here and as long as they worked hard, they could make it. Now, the last two words of the first part of my title, Dream Deferred, those refer to a very, very famous poem by a Washington DC poet, Langston Hughes. In fact, there's another uh, nice cafe and bookstore in the DC area called Busboys and Poets because he actually got his start writing poems off of uh, you know, napkins, right? And he wrote this poem called Harlem Dream Deferred. Just in case, I would like to read it so we can understand what he was talking about when it comes to this idea of the American dream. So Langston wrote, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? So in other words, Langston Hughes had written about this idea that for those of us who are kissed by the sun, us people of color, African Americans in particular, in theory, this American dream sounds really great on paper, but in practice, what happens when you have to navigate the system when burdened with the gravity of racial discrimination, right? It, you know, so again, Harisha Alger talks about those who are bound to rise. But again, if you're black in this country, bound to rise is not exactly how it works in practice. Okay. So that's what this title encapsulates, this tension behind the American dream that's available to all, at least as purported by the government, and then the dream deferred, right? This idea of the tension of the theory versus practice. The reason why I situate my book in Washington, D.C. is for a number of reasons. The first of which I would like to share with you all is a, a term or concept that uh, I really expound upon called constitutional responsibility. So during the 1940s, that's when I first start the period of my book to focus. Does anyone have any idea what most African-American women were doing in this country? What, what were most African-American doing? women doing to get paid? That is absolutely correct. Domestic workers, right? In fact, in some places in the South, roughly up to 80% of Black women were domestic workers, right? And again, this is before the hashtag Me Too movement, right? And so we have to remind ourselves of the scores of untold stories of individuals who were were who assaulted, attacked, and under constant threat um, from sexual purveyors within the home, right? That we will never know about as part of the job. So that being said, around World War, around World War II, the door opened up. Anyone heard of Rosie the Riveter? We can do it, right? And so the door opened up due to supply demand issues. And for many women, which is a euphemism, euphemism for white women, and many African-Americans, they were able to enter into the workforce in mass. Now, the reason why Washington DC is special is because think about the appeal for someone coming from the South where you had limited job prospects, either in the agricultural sector or in a domestic lab uh, laboring position. The idea is that and leaving the South and going up North, just like the Statue of Liberty was this symbol open of openness to those coming to our American shores, I suggest that the Statue of Freedom on top of the Capitol building was perhaps an equally as powerful symbol that an individual could come and finally get a slice of this thing called the American dream. I mean, after all, we might understand in the 1940s that some racial discrimination is going to take place in Jackson, Mississippi. After all, 
maybe in the 1940s, we might understand that racial discrimination will take place in Selma, Alabama. But if there's one place an African-American can go and be treated with dignity and respect based upon the principles as espoused in our Constitution, right, and in the Declaration of Independence of Truth, Justice, the American Way, Life, Liberty, Pursuit of Happiness, right? If there's one place, that would be Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., I argue, has this constitutional responsibility of representing the best of all of what America is. In fact, if you go downtown Washington, D.C., one of the unique features is that it has um, virtually all the states represented with the street names, right? This idea that it represents all of America. And by the way, D.C. was laid out by a black man, Benjamin Banneker, right? To really hammer home uh, this relationship of the responsibility, I'd like to read you a quote. On no level of our national existence can inequality be justified. Within the federal government itself, however, tolerance of inequality would be odious. What we cherish as an ideal for a nation as a whole must today be honestly exemplified by the federal establishment. That, ladies and gentlemen, was President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who said this. And so I think this quote perfectly encapsulates this idea that if anyone is going to show the way, it's going to be the federal government in terms of being fair and equal. A couple more pieces. Federal government jobs were colloquially known as GGJ. Has anyone heard the term good government job before? Okay. And so again, remember what we're talking about. In contrast to agricultural or domestic positions, these good government jobs were very much attractive to African-Americans in contrast to the jobs that they left from the South. Now um, I'm able to take a test. It is virtually very transparent how I'm going to get a job. So in other words, if this gentleman right here types 58 words a minute and this young lady right here types 67 words a minute, who's going to get the job? This young lady, again, it has nothing to do with um, the fact that he's an Eagles fan or anything of that nature in here in Baltimore. No, no, there's nothing to do that, you know, we're not casting aspersions on the fact he's wearing color orange. No, no, there's nothing to do with that. It's just, we like her because she's more efficient. She can type more words a minute, plain and simple. And so that appealed to many African-Americans, right? This idea that, because think about how the private sector is literally free to discriminate, right? Meaning not necessarily racially, but you can choose who you want to hire and what you want to do, right? Um, uh, for example, anyone heard of Chick-fil-A? Uh, what's unique about Chick-fil-A? Does anybody know? They're not open on what? They're not open on Sundays. And no one can make them open on Sundays. In fact, the Super Bowl was held in Atlanta this past year, right? And the Chick-fil-A franchise is actually based in Atlanta. They actually have Chick-fil-A franchises inside the Mercedes-Benz Dome where the Super Bowl is played. But guess what? They still were not open on Sunday. That's their prerogative as a private enterprise. But see, in the public sector, we talked about this duty, this constitutional responsibility. There's this idea of transparency, open records to all. Every single one of us can go downtown to the National Archives and Record Administration and ask to see records that are stored. It is your right. They're accessible to all. And so that's what makes, for me, this study so very fascinating is because we see what the data says about who gets hired and who gets paid at what rate. And so that's what leads me to my next revelation. So we go from this idea of why federal work would be attractive to many African-Americans, right? Coming up from the South, they saw it as an opportunity where they could actually even the score maybe, right? But what we find is that with most things human, it's relatively complex. The government did in fact lead the public sector, the private sector, in providing opportunities for many African Americans, especially in the wake of World War II. And I should also make a mention really briefly that so many African Americans came into Washington, D.C. to work that after the war ended, many stayed. And therefore, Washington, D.C. ended up earning the nickname, what? Chocolate City. Chocolate City. 
Now, I don't know if you've been there lately, but it's more like a, a latte swirl or, you know, something of that nature. I mean, no, seriously, I, I don't know about you, but the other day I was driving down, I was looking for Rhode Island. I was like, where is Rhode Island? And then they're like, no, bro, it's called Noma. Right? I mean, right, it's called Noma, as in North Massachusetts. I, I don't know what's going on, but, but gentrification is what's going on in Washington, D.C., right? Okay, great. But the, in 1971, the peak population was 71.1%. That means, it, how ironic, right? This idea that at the turn of the century, there were virtually no African-Americans in federal government, not that many in D.C., and then all of a sudden, by the 70s, virtually seven out of every 10 people walking the streets is black, African-American. Literally, African-Americans became the face of federal government, right? And again, this is after many years of segregation, because I don't know if you all know, but your president, Woodrow Wilson, segregated the federal establishment. Uh, you, you all know this story? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, okay, well, I'll just speak to it really briefly before going to my next piece, which is um, in 1913, right after Woodrow Wilson took office, Postmaster Alfred Burleson approached him only a month after he was uh, inaugurated. At that time... Mail was delivered uh, most quickly and most efficiently how? Around 1913. How do you think they got mail across the country quickly? Trail, train, very good, train. And so the idea was that um, he came pleading to the president, you know, Mr. President, the morale of my workers is suffering. My white workers have to share the same tight spaces with black workers. They have to share the same sheets share the same glasses, even though we try our best to clean them. My white workers, they just are simply not producing the way that they should because their esteem is lowered, their morale is low. You've got to do something about this, Mr. President. So he did. He agreed to this idea of, well, let's segregate our federal workforce. And many of you have seen the movie um, Hidden Figures or anything of that nature. Well, it was 10 times worse than that. Right? You're talking about working for the exact same federal agency, you're working in the exact same room, and they literally would take all types of measures to segregate workers, as in having stacking file cabinets all the way up from the floor to the ceiling just to make sure workers were separated. Again, maybe the argument that, well, these people on this side work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and these people work for the Forestry Service, maybe that argument might fly. But no, we're talking about you're working for the same agency, working for the same American public, but yet you're segregated physically, right? And so this segregation did not start to pass away until after World War II. You had so many African-American workers who were part of the workforce, it, was, it simply wasn't efficient to keep everybody se separate, separated and segregated, although the Pentagon was very expensive because they had double bathrooms in every floor when it was first built. And so now you're talking about now African-Americans are part of this federal workforce. They have high numbers, right? High in terms of quantity. But now we have to start to shift our focus to analyze not just the quantity of African-American workers, but also the quality of African-American workers. And what we find is that consistent over time, Black federal workers suffer from lower wages and slower raises within the federal workforce. They're what I now term as black collar workers. Just like you have blue collar workers, which refer to industrial manual labor, or white collar workers, right, which refer to you know, professional. You have pink collar workers as well, which refer to women in the workplace. My new term that I offer and share with you is black collar workers, because these workers were defined by the black skin that touch the color of their garment, the color of their garments. And again, how do we know this? Well, especially after 1947, the federal government kept data. Unlike the private sector where we really don't know how much people make unless they tell us. Maybe Fortune 500 companies might brag about how much their CEOs are getting compensated. But other than that, they're under no obligation to share. When it comes to the federal government, we know how much people are getting paid. For any of you who have, you know anybody working with the federal government, you know that there's a very established system. It's called the general schedule, GS scale, GS 1 through 16. And then above that, 
there's a special uh, category called Senior Executive Service or SES, right? Which tries to incentivize keeping high powered talent within the public sector city, so they don't defect to the pub private sector. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you were an African-American college graduate, you had a greater chance of having a mid to lower range job as opposed to if you were a white college graduate who were more likely to land a professional position, right? So again, some of you might be thinking, well, that makes sense because very, well, at least initially, many African-American workers didn't have access to education. Again, when you aggregate the data over time, it is very manifest clear that over time, African-American workers still suffered from lower wages and slower wages, slower raises, despite how much education that they had, right? It is very much consistent. And, and in fact, the numbers in 1981, when I end the study, are very similar to the numbers in 1942, when, uh, 1941, when I start the study, as far as most African-American workers still being at GS level eight or below, right? And it's still very difficult for African-American workers to find themselves um, getting promoted, right? And to convey that, that sentiment of how difficult it was uh, for an African-American um, who had few opportunities to get promoted and was getting paid less um, on the dollar, uh, there's another quote that, that comes to mind that, that I, I think um, encapsulates this frustration of being a, um, a, a black collared worker. Sterling Tucker, who was the executive director of the Washington Urban League said in 1963, the Negro in Washington and everywhere else is expected to live as well, eat as well, dress as well, educate his children as well, and have a nice home on less money than whites. And even Negroes aren't that smart. So what do we have here is a dynamic that is very much complicated. On one level, we have the federal government, which is to be lauded and applauded for taking groundbreaking steps. Let's not overlook that the federal government was one of the first to actually start charting uh, racial data within the workplace. Um, let's not also forget that the federal government uh, had groundbreaking policies, such as uh, the invention of the equal, the equal Employment Opportunity Commission, right, in 1964. Uh, what was groundbreaking about the EEOC was that before you could file a grievance and you can make a complaint about not getting treated correctly on the job, and maybe it would be resolved to your satisfaction, maybe not. But see, for the very first time with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, you now had the possibility that monetary damages would be assessed if you were caught with your hand in a cookie jar as far as being racially discriminatory. But here's the deal. While this is groundbreaking, while this provided opportunity for relief for a vast number of individuals, a couple of details. One is that this measure did not apply to federal workers until 1972, right? So you talk about nearly a decade after it first came out. And then secondly, it only applied to businesses that had a hundred or more workers. And if you know anything about our American capitalistic economy, over 90% of all businesses have fewer than a hundred workers. So on one level, they're to be applauded for creating these initiatives, but at the same time, the question is how effective were they? And then even when the EEOC was up and running, they sustained a backlog of up to 100,000 cases, right? And so you're talking about it would take roughly up to two years to hear back from the EEOC as to whether you had a claim that was worthy of pursuing before you would maybe make the significant investment in getting an attorney and pursuing a discrimination case. And so on one level, they're to be applauded, but at the same time, we see that there's very little change over time when it comes to the actual status of African-American workers. You see, and this is the subject of my beef, if you would, of my argument with other historians, because many historians will talk about, well, we have to study change over time. We have to study change over time. 
But my argument is, well, at least when you're looking at black federal workers, it sounds more like continuity over time. We have an alleviation, but not an elimination of racial discrimination, right? And so for me, when looking at the data, it's apparent that racial discrimination is functioning much like water. What do I mean? Well, water is unique in that it always takes the shape of its container, right? And so over the years, new policies would be erected and new ways of resistance and affecting those policies would be created. And over time, we see that it wasn't a matter of African-Americans not being competent. They were indeed competent. But then it became a question of compatibility, not competency, but compatibility. This idea that African-Americans still were not perceived as being fit for leadership. Even though I end this study in 1981, you can go online and check out the EEOC website and find studies as recent as 2016 that still talks about surveys that they've conducted that show that many white workers in the workplace find it difficult to perceive or accept African-Americans in leadership positions. African-Americans are part of this fabric of this Thing called America, this great experiment. But in practice, just like this song that we listened to earlier with Jill Scott talking about her petition, the question still remains, to what degree have these promises not been fulfilled? It is, I think, very important for us to acknowledge the unsung stories, the untold individuals, who continue to labor diligently for this belief, for this promise, in hopes that one day it will cash in and mean something for them. And I think these stories must be told and they must be remembered and acknowledged. Because when you do look at it, you will find that as opposed to taking out their frustrations out in people and acts of domestic terrorism, Many of these African-Americans stayed the course. I've, I found cases where people have been waiting in the pursuit of a, a new promotion for as long as five years, seven years, 12 years. And in one case, one individual waited as long as 19 years. Who in here has 19 years to wait for a promotion? And it's not as if this individual was trying to take over the establishment, right? And go from vice president to president. He simply was trying to move from a grade four to a grade five. And again, he filed the right paperwork. He did what they asked him to do. He followed the protocol, but there was always a reason or call it excuse or justification. And so I think for me, um, you know, just in conclusion, as far as me just setting the table with a couple of thoughts, I'd love to, to hear from you, see if you have stories as well. Maybe you know somebody who works for the federal government. Maybe you work for the federal government, right? But for me, this story, even though it takes place in 1941 and to 1981, it is a referendum as to where we are now. And let me explain. If what I tell you is true, if the data that I've presented to you in this book is solid, then what does this say if within the public sector, where arguably there's a constitutional responsibility, where arguably there's more transparency, where arguably you're literally working for the machinery called democracy, I mean, right? It's not as if you're uh, a carpenter and you're, you're into to lumber making. It's not as if you're, you're making pizzas. No, if you work for the federal government, you literally work for the machinery of American democracy. Truth, justice, right? The American way, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be self-evident, right? So with, within, if within the public sector, we still have evidence and data that shows consistently over time, black federal workers suffer from lower wages and slower raises. 
<laughs> then what does this possibly suggest about the private sector? Because again, when you talk about a good government job, yes, they are good jobs, but the question is, are they great jobs? What would make them great jobs? And what do we need to do to cultivate an environment where more African-Americans are actually partaking in great jobs? Because if I were to ask you right now, where in the public mainstream do you see blacks getting paid? Like, like, like big time cash money, like where? Sports and entertainment, right? So, okay, that's great. So that means if you have some bars in here, that means if you can um, do 360 windmill dunk in here, then good for you, right? And that means you might make a slot in one of the few, well, 32 teams, right? For the whole, on the whole planet. There's only one NBA. But what about the everyday people? Because again, when you go to Silicon Valley, right? You're talking about people in the private sector are able to make however much money that they are willing to work for. It's, it's open-ended. There's, there's, no, there's no cap on that, right? Um, but yet when it comes to African-Americans, there's this idea that maybe we should just be happy or satisfied that we just have these good, stable jobs, even though they're capped with their salaries. I mean, if you look at federal salaries online, they're, they're capped, right? I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible to become a millionaire working um, with a federal salary, Right. Um, you know, not, notwithstanding you have expenses, right? Of course, if you save all your money, but um, you, I think you know where I'm coming from. But within the private sector, the question is, what type of participation do we have? And so for me, this window into time is a referendum into reminding us as to how we can look better at the present and connect to the here and now, right? Because think about how time is, they say it's relative. I, I'm not so sure. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I mean, you know, well, at least when it comes to racial matters, that's when time all of a sudden becomes fungible and relative. For example, how many of you have heard this idea that, well, w when it came to owning slaves or what have you, Thomas Jefferson was complex and, you know, and at that time, you know, it was just different at that time, right? Well, okay, but rape was still rape, wasn't it? I mean, mur murder was still murder back then, wasn't it? But, but now all of a sudden, this idea of owning people or mistreating people from a racial perspective, well, it depends upon the times and how you want to look at it. I I'm not quite so sure, right? I mean, and so what we're talking about is a scenario where by, if we look back 60 years from now, on the year 2020, right? It's 2019, but if we look 60 years from now, what are we going to say? Are we gonna scratch our heads and say, wow, you know, maybe we could have done better? I mean, that's what we do when we look back at the 50s and 60s. If you look at some of that YouTube footage of people sitting at lunch counters, peacefully getting smacked in the head, being beaten and attacked, ketchup and mustard being thrown in their faces, all because they wanted to sit at a lunch counter it looks savage. It looks barbaric to us. But those are just normal, everyday Americans, right? I mean, at least at that time, that, that, that's what they told themselves. And so, I, I, again, I, I think that for, for me, this window into Black federal workers in terms of, yes, it opened up doors and good government jobs. I, I just still want to challenge us to think critically about, but what are we doing in the here and now to go from good to great, as Malcolm Gladwell would say? Because, I mean, that, that, that world appears to be open to many of my white brothers and sisters in the private sector, right? Uh, you all heard the famous Chris Rock joke about uh, he, he's neighbors with, uh, uh, you know, famous black celebrities like LeBron James and Jay-Z. And then next to him is a what? Is, is a, just a white dentist. Just, just a dentist, right? And so this idea that economic freedom is perhaps more attainable or perhaps there's less friction in attaining it for some of us in this country, maybe that's something that we still need to keep our focus upon, right? Um, maybe it's not a matter of me gaining more civil rights, but maybe us looking at how we can develop more economic rights as well. And so um, I would love to take some, uh, some questions and comments um, about this topic, but Again, 
these stories must be told. These stories must be remembered because these people have labored very diligently in order to ensure that many Americans have been able to pursue their American dream preferred. And so the question is, what will we do to remember those who still must struggle with an American dream deferred? Thank you, I'd like to take some questions. Very good. Um, if you are interested in the Wilsonian era, I recommend uh, Dr. Eric Yellen's book called uh, Racism in uh, the Federal Service. Yeah, you know, it's because he's talked specifically about that period. And what I can tell you here today is that Woodrow Wilson, as many of you all know, was a very esteemed individual. Um, he was president of Princeton University, became governor, state of New Jersey. Uh, but he also showed birth of a nation inside the White House and call it a flash of white lightning. He actually liked the movie. Um, birth of a Nation, as you know, is that 1915 film by D.W. Griffith that uh, celebrated the rise of the Klan, okay, the Ku Klux Klan, okay? Um, and so uh, just isn't it ironic that over a century later, uh, we, we still have movies receiving awards dealing with the Klan. It's just ironic just how much race is a woven into the fabric of our existence. But to the young man's question, um, the Wilsonian era was known for this idea of progressivism, okay? And so, unfortunately, African Americans were viewed as not being ideal workers. And so part of the progressivist movement was to minimize the amount of African Americans you had in the workplace because that would help the workplace operate more efficiently. Right, so that goes step in step with what we were saying earlier about him agreeing with Alfred Burleson about yes, maybe less in terms of blacks is more for us in terms of production, right? And again, it wasn't until World War II when supply demand issues really changed the whole character and caliber of our American government. And I think this is important because let's just think about this. For many of us who are in a uh, relationship and have a significant other, um. If this individual shows up like full grill with teeth and, and a bouquet of roses, that's a good thing, right? Or does it depend? Meaning um, they just show up on your job and they have this bouquet of roses and this big cheese grin and they say, oh, I, I, was, just, I was just thinking about you. And you're like, what? And you're like, no, I, was just, I just really was thinking about you. Or would your reaction be different if they had come in at 4 a.m. that morning didn't respond to your texts, smelled like some old day toilet, right? That sort of deal, right? And then they, they, they come up to you with the bouquet of roses and they have this nice smile. What do you think about that bouquet of roses then, right? Like, wait a minute, like, what, what's this about? Um, are you doing this to cover up for something that you've done? So I say that to say that the intent behind actions are very instructive for us, right? It's not as if when the uh, federal workforce was opened up to African-Americans and women, it's not as if you had federal uh, managers sitting up late at night, tossing and turning in their beds about, oh man, I just wish more African-Americans had an equal chance at, at, at making a living. I, we have got to do something. Let's open up the doors and, and give them jobs. No, that, that wasn't the case. The idea was we need people to keep this machine in operation, right? It's a supply demand issue. We just need people. And so I think the intent behind those actions are instructive because that might help explain why the problem perhaps was so very persistent and consistent over the years. It wasn't as if African-Americans were brought in off of altruistic notions of equity and justice. It was just done as a matter of convenience. And so if it's just a matter of convenience, 
then obviously your investment is going to be minimized to a certain degree. You're not fully vested in this idea of I see you as an equal, I see you as my, as my, as, as, as my partner, and, and we're actually going to do this together, we're working together as teammates, no. And so that, I think that might help explain why, as I said earlier, when I say racism is like water, it takes the shape of its container, Every time there was some sort of new progressive measure, it seems as if there was some new adaptation to it, right? Because again, in so many circles, African-Americans just weren't seen as equal. And the last thing I want to say to, to your, your, your question about what was going on in that Wilsonian era, think about how difficult it was for African-Americans to enter the workplace because at least in the private sector, there was this idea that African-Americans would, anyone heard the phrase before? know their place, right? They would know their, I mean, so if you're a domestic worker, you know your place. You're supposed to be quiet, be deferential, be obsequious, right? Because the idea is about, it's about power and control. Uh, I'm white, I'm in power and I'm in control and you have to do what I say. It's just that simple. Um, but when it came to the federal workforce, the idea is that if I'm white, I wake up in a segregated neighborhood I go to church in a segregated church. I go shopping in segregated stores. African-Americans are not even allowed in the stores. Or if they are, it's after closing. They have to come in the back door. So I, I live literally in an all-white world, right? I go, you know, my kids go to all-white school. I drop them off. And then when I pull up to work, like, what? Like, now all of a sudden, I have other African-Americans working with me, maybe as my equal, and God forbid, they tested above me, and so therefore they're my superior? Like, what? And so for many African-Americans who entered the workforce at that early stage, before we were officially desegregated, you know, which obviously took several decades, and in some places of our country, they're still more segregated today than they were. Okay, but that's another story. For many African-Americans, um, this tension was uh, essentially uh, at... They, they, many African Americans were blamed for this type of tension, right? And so, um, again, uh, there was actually incentive, or shall we say, a disincentive to promote African Americans above whites. I've even documented a couple of cases where there were white strikes, meaning that white individuals in the federal sector refused to show up for work just because their boss was black. Is that a true story? That happened to you too, or? Yeah. Oh, yes. Question in the back. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to see if you had some thoughts on um, is how. Um, okay. So the rise of neoliberalism within, especially the Democratic Party, who, which had traditionally been one of the sort of the greatest advocates of robust federal employment. We saw under the Clinton administration, certainly continued in the Bush administration, but actually very much continued under the Obama administration as well, is this sort of privileging in, in discursively in the way they talk about things of private sector jobs. And, oh, we want to create incentives, incentive programs. Uh, uh, we want to um, uh, provide um, uh, 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 loans to uh, uh, historically marginalized people, loans to women and, and, and black folks to own their own businesses and things like that. So we've seen this sort of like aspirational discussion regarding racial justice. And it, it talked about one thing you were discussing, which is kind of like raising the ceiling. But to me, it also seems like it's really abandoned the great middle class um, and the great middle class of marginalized people that, that grew very much within the period of greatest investment in federal programs. And, you know, a lot of times, sort of, there's a discussion or tension between those who emphasize class or economics versus those who at least verbally speak of race. But I do feel like in the desire, and I do think there are some politics behind it, the desire to speak to verbalize this commitment to racial justice and racial aspirations, they have in fact abandoned something that has 
they demonstrated to have one of the greatest impacts on the uh, black people, especially, but especially black women, in fact, when you look at federal employment numbers. You know, um, and that's an excellent point in, in question um, because that's one of the reasons why I ended my study in 1981 because when Reagan took office, he famously declared that government is the problem. And so let me tie that back to what the gentleman was saying about abandoning the federal government as uh, an incubator for American success and this idea that we're now just going to completely focus and invest upon the private sector. Um, this goes back to this idea of the good government job we talked about, right? Uh, I don't know if you all have anybody in your family, but I, I could tell you that in mine. Uh, my aunt, high school education, no college degree, went straight to the federal service, 35 years with the EPA, and then 35 years later, she's a homeowner, has her cars, kid went to college. My aunt, my, on my dad's side, uh, same situation, no college degree, high school education, had a 30-year career with the Federal Reserve. And so this idea that federal government was a place where people could go and make themselves something, right? Make something of themselves. But it's not just African-American workers. <laughs> Has anyone heard of Northrop Grumman? Has anyone heard of Lockheed, right? Many of these private enterprises also benefited from government largesse. These private companies would not be as big as they are did they not been, had they not benefited from federal contracts consistently. So this idea that it's only the African Americans who want to leech on the federal government, you know, they want to extend the New Deal and just sit around and scratch themselves and, and ask for a handout, that's ridiculous. If anything, it is white private enterprise that is taking the most amount of money from the federal government. But yet, what happens, so going back to the young man's point in the back, but right when you had African-Americans who were now participating in mass in the federal government. Because again, what did we say earlier? Uh, the only two ways that we pretty much can identify easily where African-Americans are known to get paid is what? Sports, entertainment. So this federal government sector was this brand new thing where um, a lot of people, it wasn't just one or two, it wasn't just an isolated example, but the thousands of individuals were able to, to get jobs and establish themselves. And then all of a sudden, think about how this looks, because because uh, African Americans are actually overrepresented in federal government according to their population. They're thirteen percent of the nation's population, but represent eighteen percent of all federal uh, workers, and which is actually even higher when you think about how most Black federal workers are concentrated only in you know in select cities. It's not as if you have that many Black federal workers in Wyoming or Idaho, right? And so you talk about a lot of these um, these metropolitan areas. But again, only after African Americans reach this critical mass, magically, we have this rhetoric about the government is too big. Now we need to cut back. And now we need to be more efficient. But what's interesting is during the Reagan era, while there were significant cutbacks because government is the problem, do you know what was not cut back? The, there you go. The young man is correct. Uh, we actually increased our military spending. We tripled our military spending during the Reagan era, right? Reaganomics, right? So the idea of the social services, I mean, no. I mean, remember, uh, Gordon Gecko, greed is good, right? That was the mantra of the 80s, this idea of, well, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, even if you don't have any bootstraps, or at least buy yourself a pair of boots and then pull yourself up, right? Okay, well, that's when we started to see this narrative. And also, um, let's think about more modern times. Um, is anyone here young enough to remember that when people would arrive in the airport, you were able to go up to the gate to greet them? Does, does anyone remember that? Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. So it's true, ladies and gentlemen. It's true. Because right? you know how now they have somebody who's actually sitting down. Right, right. You know, just, just you know, just sit. it's their job. They get paid to sit and look to make sure that nobody go, goes the opposite way into the gate terminal. Right? You know, that, that's a new job that's been created. But trust me, it's true, ladies and gentlemen. It used to be a very big deal when someone would fly in and come visit you. You actually go up to the gate and greet them. But all that changed after what? 9-11. Now, if you have nothing to do on a Friday night, mm -hmm, go uh, research on Google, right? and check out all the narratives about 
if those TSA workers had only did their jobs, ladies and gentlemen, what I submit to you is that these were very thinly veiled racial critiques. It wasn't just TSA that they were criticizing, it was the worker who was a part of TSA, as in the black federal worker, right? That's, that's what I suggest to you. And, that, um, and then there was this uh, movement to uh, now um, make, because it used to be privately contracted out. Then there's this movement to make it part of the uh, Department of Homeland Security um, to you know, give it this official status and vetting. But I, I, I saw this to say that, has anyone seen the movie Get Out? Remember that final line at the end? Um, blankety blank TSA. The reason why that line was ironic, if not funny, is because I think it flipped on its head this narrative of the incompetent black federal worker, right? Because DeRay McKesson's character actually pieced it all together. He, he used his brain, did the detective work, and actually ended up coming through in the end, right? And so, yes, I think the days of going to the federal government as a place of um, refuge um, is now starting to, to pass and fade. But it's interesting how that pattern changes because if you recall back to the 1930s, immediately after the Great Depression, why, yeah, I, I think the government was supposed to be there to help people. When you talk about um, the, 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 the you know, Great Society and the New Deal after that, um, the government was supposed to help people. It was supposed to be a place of refuge. It literally created jobs. I mean, it created jobs. I mean, Hoover Dam out in the, you know, Nevada to uh, the Works Projects Administration, they literally just created jobs for people. But notice when most of those people were white, right? That's when the government had to step in. That's when the government had to do something. But then we fast forward many years later, and then when um, the, the faces start to change, that's when we have to cut. We have to cut back. It's, it, we're bleeding too much. So to the young man's question, yes, um, there is a lot of that rhetoric taking place now because the government has now been uh, demonized as a center of waste. And that may not be entirely true. Uh, yes. So uh, I, I, saw, uh, I saw the Gordon Parks uh, retrospective at, I guess, it was the National Portrait Gallery, like maybe back in November or so. And I was kind of intrigued on your talk because I saw uh, the book cover has a photo, at least one, I have maybe more of those are by Gordon Parks, but the one of the woman with the broom. Uh, that was kind of like the headline photo of the whole thing at the Portrait Gallery. And um, uh, I, so, so it got me thinking about what was the nature of the work of most black federal workers at that time? Because, you know, you, you wouldn't know from that picture that that's not just a regular, you know, domestic worker from in the South. Excellent question. So th thank you for um, raising up this young lady because she has a name, right? See, many of these workers are nameless and faceless. They're unsung. They're untold, they're unknown, but I'm glad to share with you her name. Her name is Ella Watson. And as the young man said, she was famously photographed in an, uh, 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 by Gordon Parks in what he entitled American Gothic. It, it was a take on, have y'all you, you seen the, 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 the man with maybe his daughter or wife, you know, standing, looking kind, kind of stoic with the pitchfork? It was, it was a take on that, right? But if you notice, she's alone. Right, unlike the, the, the famous painting, right? And her story is this. She too was uh, looking for a good government job. She came up from the South, Alabama, um, and she also was touched by this evil called racial discrimination. Her father was taken away by a lynch mob. Now, again, I, I, just, I just don't wanna dwell on it, but I do wanna spend a moment on what I just said. I said lynch mob. As in no court system, extra extrajudicial means where people were just killed. This is what took place in our country. This is what happened. Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative documents over 4,000 cases of people who lost their lives just because, right? I mean, this is, a, and think about 
how that number has to be magnified of the horror and suspense of not knowing if you're next or someone you know is next, right? I mean, so that's the type of psychological warfare that was taking place, terrorism domestically. So her father, I mean, I mean think about that, right? You, you go home today and, you know, and, and, you know, your dad is being strewn out. And, you know, I, mean, I mean, this is horrible. So her dad was killed by a lynch mob and her husband was killed prematurely in a car accident. And so she was left to care for her two grandchildren because her daughter was mentally incapacitated. So her idea was, okay, well, anything is better than here. I need to get on up and get on out here. And she moved up north, took a, uh, uh, a entrance, federal entrance service exam, made friends uh, with a uh, white woman at that time, you know, during the process. The look on her face, the look on her face perfectly encapsulates what we're talking about in terms of black collar worker and American dream deferred because while they made movies about this phenomenon called government girls, they were called G girls. They made movies about this where many white women came up uh, to uh, Washington DC. They worked for the federal government at day and at night, they were able to play and party and just, just enjoy the, the fruits of their youth, right? She actually showed up to work when many of these white G girls were getting off of work. So she showed up around five and to the young man's question as to what type of jobs do black people have? Well, here's the irony. While the jobs were more stable and had higher pay, they were also very similar to the jobs they had in the, pri in the private sector, meaning they were cleaning or doing uh, tough industrial work, right? So it wasn't, it, was, uh, it wasn't uncommon to find African-American workers in jobs that required large amounts of manual labor such as the general printing office. Think about how many blacks work for the United States Postal Service now, right? Even though it's a quasi-governmental agency. And uh, this young lady was a charwoman. Ella Watson was a charwoman, which meant that she was cleaning up offices of people. So very similar to domestic work, but the idea was more stability and higher pay. Oh, by the way, before I forget, speaking of cleaning offices, Guess whose office she had to clean? Yeah, she ended up cleaning the office of the white lady she scored better than on the federal entrance examination. So I think that look pretty much encapsulates this idea of this promise, right? The Jill Scott song we talked about, my petition. I mean, you, you promised me, you said that I do well on a test then I'm going to do well. It's, it's, it's just that simple. What's so complicated? W which one is it here? Right? How am I cleaning her office when I score better than her? It is, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Help me out. On one level, I'm glad that I'm not homeless, I suppose. I, I have some source of income, I guess. Right? I feel good about that. But at the same time, um, she should be cleaning my office. Didn't happen. American Dream Deferred. So I have a question, um, intimate crowd here. Uh, does anyone know anybody who uh, worked for the federal uh, government or, or works for the federal government? So uh, yeah, so what, what are some of your stories or experiences? Like, what did they tell you all about what it's like you know, working for the federal government? Overworked and underpaid. You know, that is unfortunate. Um, the only sector where federal workers outpace the private sector, well, the only place or section is um, in jobs that do not require a college education, right? So that's where federal work will pay higher. But you're right. I mean, if you have a college degree um, or even more, then yes, you will find that the private sector will definitely outpace and, out, uh, and pay more than the uh, public sector, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad, as I said, my dad was from North Philly. White guy, of course. No, only high school. And he got hired basically right out of high school to work for Social Security Administration. And it was a very, uh, you know, it was very predictable. You know, it, it had everything you would want from a job in terms of predictability, in terms of uh, benefits and things of that nature. 
Um, so yeah, work, and he worked that job for probably like 15 years. You know, and, and, and to his point about how it was very predictable and provided that stability, I mean, I, I think we also should consider how um, the civil rights movement happened when? I mean, let's just do a little math. Hmm, roughly a generation after many of these Black Federal workers were able to enter the workforce in terms of, um, you know, it may not be a direct causal link, but I would like to think that there's some influential factor here as far as once many African-Americans were finally stabilized uh, in many ways, because I mean, think about that whole Maslow's pyramid of needs, right? So if, if I'm not stressed 25, eight, you know, of, of the day trying to figure out where my next meal is coming from and, you know, I got to run from pillar to post, then I might actually have a little bit more time to focus and concentrate on some of these larger abstract ideas, such as freedom and justice and equality and th th those sorts of deals, right? And so I, I don't think it's any coincidence when you look at the timing of the zenith of the civil rights movement taking place literally uh, 20, 20 years, a, a generation after many African worker, workers entered um, the workforce in mass, right? So the stability was key, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and to your point, um, I, I, I just really, Maybe it's me, but I just really feel as if we're not talking enough about the cash money. What, what did Wu-Tang say? Cash, what? Rules everything around me, right? I mean, we live in a capitalistic economy and we cannot overlook the fact, again, I, I understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that today all my problems are because of the white man, right? That, that's not what I'm saying exactly. But at the same time, it will be foolhardy for us not to acknowledge what has not been a factor in my life. I'm connected to this thing called history. My people, my ancestors were brought over here in, in a capitalistic economy. We're not compensated for centuries of labor. I mean, again, so the whole point is you come to this country and you work and you are valued for your work and you are compensated and then you husband those resources and leverage them accordingly, then what happens if you don't get paid to begin with? Hello, right? You're already at a deficit. We're talking about over two and a half centuries of the era of enslavement, right? So when we talk about a capitalistic economy, the relationship African-Americans have had in terms of getting paid was a frustrated relationship from the very get-go. And then after the era of enslavement, that's when in many ways hell truly began. Remember, the KKK wasn't in existence during the era of enslavement. KKK came about after the era of enslavement as a way to enforce and keep the Negro in his place, right? Then you had the sprouting up of the black codes in the South, which criminalized black behavior. You were now a vagrant if you're seen standing on a street corner talking to two other blacks. Right? And anyone, you saw that uh, uh, documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay, right? This idea of the loophole. Uh, you have plantations on Monday, all of a sudden we end slavery on Tuesday. So, what happens to those plantations on Wednesday? Uh, somebody's got to work them. And so, you came up with this convict lease system. Remember, slavery was outlawed except where the party was duly convicted of a crime. And so this idea of literally associating and criminalizing black behavior started at a very early age. I mean, I know we're in Baltimore and we, we talk about, you know, the, the Freddie Grays of the world, but that's just a continuation of a larger thread that's been going on for a very long time. This idea of criminalizing black behavior and having others profit off of that. And so I say all that the same when you look at era of enslavement, then you look at um, you know, that, that frustration and the failed reconstruction, which only lasted 12 years. I mean, you look at Jim Crow segregated society, right? Up until the 1950s or so. And then this idea of black federal workers, this, this finally maybe opens up a window, a wedge of people being able to access the American dream consistently. But then 
Even that's complicated by this idea that black federal workers suffer from lower wages and slower raises over time. So what does a brother and sister have to do? So maybe after my next book, I don't know, I might uh, hit, hit the rap circuit and, and play basketball at the same time. Oh, one more question or comment. I mean, I'm just curious uh, for, for those of you who came on out, um, I guess what interests you about the topic, right? Uh, what, what, what's, what's your connection to um, either the American dream or black federal workers? I was gonna ask you about the, the uh, impact of Wilson on the uh, cutting off of the progress that uh, African Americans were making from the federal uh, government uh, under FDR, in, um, TR, and TAP. But I know that's not in your, no, I mean, I, I, I think Wilson was doing what he felt was best for the country. I, I, I do not think that he, even though we may look back on it and, and judge it, I do not think he thought he had a racial animus, right? That he was being discriminatory. I believe he thought he was doing what was best for the country. I mean, and I think a similar argument can be made for policies that are being, um, you know, passed today, right? Um, it's, it's not, see, it's not about race. It's, it's not about racism. It's just about being rational, right? You know, what, what what's best for the country, what's best for the economy. But again, magically, for some strange odd reason, it seems as if people of color are the ones who suffer the most. When you look at that, recent government shutdown that lasted 34 or 35 days, however you want to count it, it was African-American workers who were disproportionately affected by it. Because again, they're the ones who were concentrated towards the, the, the bottom in terms of the lower paying positions. And it's not as if they, they said, oh, hey, um, why don't you just take it easy? You can sleep in late. You know, you can pick up the kids now. You can do dinner. Um, we'll let you know when, when we're back going. No, they were asked to come on in and still work. They were being furloughed. We, they still were being asked to work, but they just weren't getting paid. It was the upper management individuals who were A, still getting paid and still being asked to work. It, it's just really bizarre that we overlook the cruel irony of this, that those who have uh, the least are asked to sacrifice the most, right? You know, and, 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 I, and I think um, it speaks to, uh, good people like you, um, who are here on a Friday night, who who believe. Well, we have to we have to believe in something, right? This idea that, um, no. It, how do we flip this around to look at it the right way? Um, it's it's it, it, I think it is ironic that those who can afford the most oftentimes end up giving the least, right? And and again, I'm not asking anybody for anything. Um, I, I'm just going by what was told to me. I'm just going by the promise, right? That Again, if you work hard, then you uh, pretty much can control your own destiny. But oftentimes when it comes to us African-Americans, whether it be in the Wilsonian era, whether it be in the Truman era, whether it be in the Reagan era or the, the Bush era or Clinton era, even the Obama era, um, you know, again, I don't recall Obama waving a magic wand during his eight years. You know, and, you know remember Black Lives Matter started on his watch, right? You know, in terms of just showing you how the racial underlying issues don't go away just because you might change um, black faces in high places. Um, obviously he did much, but um, you know, there's still more to do. And so I, I think that where that leaves us is a, 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 at a point of opportunity, right? How do we want to wrestle with the present moment? How do we want to uh, challenge ourselves to remain vigilant, to think critically, to make connections um, amongst one another, to uh, fight for what's right. Um, because I, I, I feel that it's if uh, if we all each have one life to live, why not have an American dream preferred as opposed to an American dream deferred? Thank you for coming out.
lighting it, and the restaurant and bar is still open, so feel free to hang out. And bookstore will be open until time.